With every hand lifted in this place, let's pray. The reason we lift our hands is simple. It's a sign of surrender. It's a marker letting God know that, that you deserve all the praise. So in this place, Father, we just don't lift up our hands, but we lift up our eyes. We, we want to see you for who you truly are, Father. We, we don't want to miss a thing that you have for us in this room. And, and the other reason we lift our hands is because we want you to know we're ready to receive what only you can give us, Father. And so our hands are not closed, but they are lifted and they are open because we are ready for what you have for us, Father. We receive the joy that comes only from you. We receive the peace that has your name on it. We receive the life that we have been searching for in every other capacity and have not found because it can only be found in you. Yeah. But more than anything, Father, here's what we're doing today. We're going we're gonna to say thank you. We're going to live grateful. We're going to live fully alive. We're, we're going to we're going to not ask you to do another thing because we're just going to remember all the good you've already done. So here in this place, Jesus, we want to fill it with gratitude because you are so good. We thank you, Father. We love you. We give you not just today, but we give you our lives. And we ask all this in the powerful name of your son, Jesus. And all together, we said, amen. amen. Mosaic, let's just celebrate and thank God for who he is today. Beautiful. Man, 9.30, y'all came to play today. Hey, as you take a seat, give somebody a high five. Tell them good morning. Man, it is so good to be home. I have missed y'all. Me and Beck traveling a little bit. We went to our campus in Mexico City a couple weeks ago. And, man, it was such a joy to be there and, uh, and just investing in our community down there. It's incredible people. And, and, and I got to tell you, I was so excited to go and kind of share my Spanish I've been working on a little bit. <laughs> I wanted to impress them. And so I got on stage and I had my translator there. And I looked, I was like, I don't need you. <laughs> and here was my opening line I got. I said, hola, <laughs> buenos dias. <laughs> Mi nombre es Jesús. And I was like, no, <laughs> mi nombre es not Jesus, mi nombre es Jose, his nombre es Jesus. <laughs> and I just stopped right there. So I'm just glad to be here to speak in English to y'all. <laughs> just so much better and easier. But uh, I loved being in Mexico and, and with our family down there. It is our familia and we just ate so good. I mean, the food in Mexico City is just incredible and, and there's restaurant after restaurant and good coffee shops and and, and the and the people of course you you stole my like lead in right but but for me the most beautiful thing was the people it was the conversations it, it was it was the late nights and early mornings that I, I got no sleep but came back fully alive it's crazy what human community does to our soul isn't it it's crazy how when we're in an environment of hope and health and anticipation that it's as if it's a magnet that's pulling us into something that we didn't even know we needed until we're in it in the moment. And we just came back fully energized and, and I just want to take some time for a few moments today and, and talk to you about this one little declaration of what can happen when you and I realize that there is the possibility to be full of life. In John chapter 6, verses 1 through 15, read with me as it says this. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up to a mountainside and sat down with his disciples and the Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, 
He said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he had already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up, here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. How far will they go among so many? In verse 10, Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. And when they had, had, when they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. And after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they had intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. That last verse is so encouraging to me as an introvert that even Jesus needed some alone time. <laughs> he has this crazy miracle feeding 5,000 men, probably another five to 10,000 women and children. And this story that would be told from generation to generation to generation, one of those stories where you had to be there to believe it. And then this Moment where Jesus is trying to help us see something. He's trying to help us understand that maybe we're living on the surface when we were created for the deep. Trying to remind us that there is life that has our name on it, even if we have yet to discover it on our own. And it's this beautiful moment where we get access into the heart and mind of Christ. And for me, there's a couple really important key spots that I want us to go to and and to have a conversation together when we're talking about how to be full of life. See, here in verse 5, the first thing that happens that we notice that we want to tap into is, is it says, When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for all these people to eat? So first, we notice what Jesus sees is different than sometimes what we see. And... And it's this moment where everything that would happen next, the miracle of what God would do next, the miracle of all these people being fed and would begin with this moment where Jesus sees something that you and I miss all the time. You know what he saw? People. See, see we may look and see a person, but what Jesus always looks and sees is he sees a people. He, he sees a movement. He sees potential. He sees opportunity. And, and it's crazy that you can be in the same room with the same people and see completely different things. You know what I'm talking about? It's called marriage. <laughs> right? Like we, me and Beck, were, were having a conversation recently and we're talking about the same moment. We both were there. The exact same moment. Two people. And we're arguing about the details. And she's like, no, no, this happened. I was like, no, no, I was there and I said it. She's like, you didn't say that. How are you going to tell me what I said? <laughs> she's like, because I heard it. And we just argued the same moment, the same people, but we see different things. But what, is, what does God see that we miss? And, and in this moment, it says in verse 5, when Jesus looked up. See, if you and I are going to be full of life, the first thing that you have to do is you have to change what you see. Everybody say, look up. Look up. I think so often in our lives, we're, we're, we're simply focused on the square feet in front of us that we don't see all the opportunity that's ahead of us. That, that Jesus looks up and he sees this multitude coming. He sees this crowd, this crew following him and wanting to be a part of what he was doing in the world and and he looks up. He has the discernment to realize that 
Sometimes in life, you just have to stop looking at yourself and you got to look up at the world around you. And then you break you're able to see things that you didn't see before. And it's not because they weren't there. It's because you have begin to tap into what God is trying to get you to see. But I love this moment in the life of Jesus that, that he's not only seeing it so he can prove that, oh, that's why I'm God, because I'm able to see things that you can't see. No, he's trying to teach the disciples. He's trying to teach you and I that we have access to see things through his eyes if we invite him into the process. So you got to be able to change what you see. And sometimes you need another perspective to be able to see that. I can't tell you how many times Beck will come and say, hey, can you go and grab this? It's like on the second row on the shelf. Like, for sure. And I'll walk over, and I'll go look on the second row on the shelf, and I'm like, it's not there. (laughs) And she's like, I know it's there. I put it there. It's second row next to that other thing, like in between. It's right there. And I'll go look on that second row, second shelf, in between the two things she said. I'm like, babe, it's not there. Like just last week, I was speaking in our, our campus in South Pasadena, and there was a shirt that I wanted to wear. It was like my favorite shirt recently that I bought. So, you know, like we have a shirt that like, you don't wear it, it wears you. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? It's like that, that it just it wore me, and, and I really wanted to wear it. And, and she's like, it's hanging up right there next to it. And I'm like, babe, I looked twice. It's not there. And I went to, like, church angry. Sure, it's not there. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not going to have the same power. I, I should have. <laughs> and literally, I'm at church mad because I couldn't find it. And she sends me a photo. Didn't he have the decency to call me? <laughs> Sends me a photo. Oh, oh, this shirt? <laughs> I don't understand. I, I looked exactly where that photo was, and I didn't see it. I, I wonder how many times God is looking at us asking the very same thing. Why can't you see it? Why, why, why can't we see the despair that's right in front of us? Why can't we see the person that's drowning in brokenness, that's at our job every single day, but we're so focused on our task, we miss out on what God's trying to help us see. I wonder how many moments God is just trying to shake us, just desperately saying, when will you ask me to give you the eyes to see what you cannot see without me? See, sometimes you have to change what you see and you realize that, that there's a whole world that's being made available to you. There's people that are desperately waiting to be seen. I remember years ago, I, I was like brand new in terms of following Jesus, like all in. And I was just in this space where I just wanted to hear God's voice. And if he was speaking, I wanted to have the courage to respond. And, and that was like my prayer. God, if you speak, I'll act. You you ever had a prayer, you said it, but then you didn't know you didn't really mean it until the time came? (laughs) I'm like, no, no, I I like meant it, but but now I'm like hearing it. And and I was was sitting in a church just like you right now. And I was listening and and the pastor was preaching and and all of a sudden I just, I could not hear him any longer. He was talking and I could see his lips moving, but it was as if I had just, transported to a whole different dimension. And as he was speaking, I cannot explain it, but I was there and it happened to me and it was as real as real can be. As I felt like God just started letting me see all of these teenage kids in the church. And I saw one teenage kid and he was completely checked out. And I saw another kid who was completely checked out. I just started looking all throughout the room and he, he was talking, but their soul was speaking to me. And I couldn't shut it up. And, and I heard this voice in the depths of my soul just say this simple phrase, do you see that? And I was like, I, I do, absolutely. And I'm, I'm sitting there having a conversation with God. Like, yes, I see it. And it was like 30 just teenage kids that just felt so isolated, so unseen, so bored out of their mind. And I said, yes, I see it. 
And then I heard the next thing that I wish I didn't hear. And I heard him say, what are you going to do about it? See, that's annoying when, like, we feel like God set you up. <laughs> Where it's like, it, he's just like, he knows exactly what he's doing. He's like, do you see that? You're like, yes. And you're like in tune with the spirit of God. Like, yes, God's speaking to me. And then he has that next thing. And a lot of times we don't want the next thing. We're comfortable with just hearing what God's saying when it works within the confines of what we want. But then the moment we have to stretch ourselves out of our comfort zone, the moment that it requires us to then not just see it, but do something about it, then we try to turn the volume down. And then we live a life just where God's voice has become so dull and we wonder why we're not living fully alive. It's not that he wasn't speaking, it's that we stopped listening. And, and I had a choice to make. Do I actually want to be in the current of God's movement where I'm not just committed to hearing him speak, but I'm committed to meeting him in the act? He said, what are you going to do about it? So I, I just decided I don't know what to do, but I can do something. And I see this happening in this passage, what Jesus is doing and what he does in our lives is he's trying to help us notice a void, a need. And then he's trying to change us at our core because he knows if he can change what we see, then we'll begin to change what we care about. Because in verse 6, it says this, or a little further, verse 5, after when Jesus, Jesus looked up, saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for all these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. And Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. You, you ever feel like God's just testing you? You ever just, oh, I just feel like God's, why is he always testing me? You know, test, test, test. You know, if you ever feel like why, God is just always testing me, you want to know why? Because God is always testing you. Because <laughs> he is. It's right here. It says, like, Jesus asked Philip this question. Where will we get enough bread to feed all these people? <laughs> Philip's like, I don't know. He said, he said this only to test him for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Here's what I know. There's already a good that God will do. The question is, will we meet him to actually move on that good? Will God be the only one that cares enough to act? Will God be the only one who notices the, the biggest human problems that aren't just for God to fix, but actually we can fix? That I wonder how many times God is like, I already have in mind what I want to do. What do I need to do to break you so that you can see what I see and so then you'll have the courage to do what I do? But if you feel like God's always testing you, it's because he is. But it may not be in the way that you think. So I think sometimes we think God's trying to test us just to like show us that we're not who we, we should be. That God's trying to test us to, so that we fail different things and then we see the gap between us and God see God's not trying to test you to prove that you don't have what it takes he's he's trying to test you so that he can prepare you for what he's called you to see see the test is always to reveal the truth and then the results of a test now you know how you can improve all right why did that teacher Put that like A minus. I always hated that minus. That minus haunted me my whole life. I didn't get a lot of them. Let me be honest. More B's than A's, but don't judge me. But on the rare occasion where I crushed it and I got that A, that minus would haunt me. And A, what's what? A is not good enough? I'm in the 90 percentile? Why you got to judge me with your little minus? But what that does, right? What, what the teacher is trying to communicate to you is that there's some things that you can grow in. That, that even as incredible as you did on this test, even, even as much as you were prepared, there's still something that you didn't get into your system that I want to help pull you to, because if you can 
fill the gap in the 10%, you'll realize that the test was always meant to grow you. That the test is always meant to build into you what was yet to be actualized. God never will test you to judge you. He wants to test you so you can see how much capacity is lying awake inside of your soul. And Jesus says, I already know and have in mind what I'm going to do. The question is, what are you going to do? And, and, and in verse 7, Philip answered him, it would take more than a half year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to just have a bite. Another one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Okay, so we're talking about living full of life. The first thing you have to do is you have to change what you see. You got to look up. But the second thing you have to do is, is here's what happens. When you change what you see, it changes how you act. See, and this one is about look out. Everybody say, look out. Look out. See, I love this moment in Andrew. It, is that Jesus is having a conversation with Philip where he's testing him. He's trying to see, will he actually tap into what he sees? And will he only see the problem or will he see the opportunity? And, and then Jesus is having a conversation with Philip and Andrew butts in. And he's like, okay, okay. I, I don't know what you're talking about, but here's what I know. Here's a kid. He's got five loaves and two fish. First of all, this, this story always just made me so, like, I fell for this little kid. Like, you ever been, like, middle school? You ever have, like, trauma sometimes? You, middle school is, like, the worst time in anyone's life, right? Anybody, or, or unless you were the popular kid or the athlete or the chill, right? But for the rest of us, awkward middle school was the worst three years of our lives. And for me, a huge part of it was, was lunchtime. Dang, I'm going to go back there right now. I'm going to start crying on stage. <laughs> As I hated lunchtime because I had nobody to sit with. I know we moved schools a lot. In sixth grade, we moved to a new school. I don't have any friends. And I'm sitting at lunch by myself. Me and my peanut butter and jelly sandwich, right? <laughs> and I hated lunchtime. And, and then what I really hated about lunchtime is when the bullies would come and steal my lunch. I don't know if my mom and dad are here. I don't know if I ever told them that, but, you know? Y'all sent me to a school where they bullied me. <laughs> and now I got to go to therapy because I'm traumatized. <laughs> I'm kidding. My parents are very loving. They're the best parents of all time. But I would, ha I would get my lunch stolen. And I was just like, oh, my goodness. Like this, what am I? The disciples, the follower of Jesus, stole this little boy's lunch. <laughs> we don't talk about that, but... <laughs> Homie just went trying to have lunch by himself, and Philip's like, yo, that belongs to Jesus. <laughs> you know, but there are some things in Jesus' hands that are better in our own hands. But I love the fact that Philip does not let the problem stop him. And he can look at the crowd and see 5,000 men, 10,000 women and children. I can imagine there'd be a feeling of paralysis. What in the world could we do? But here's what he discovers. You know what is far worse than just doing a little bit of good? Doing nothing. And I think so often in our lives, we, we're paralyzed because we don't think we have enough to give. And so we just stop and we give nothing when God's like, just give me something and watch what I do with that something. See, maybe you're here and you feel like this little boy with only five loaves and two fish. What in the world could God do with this? In your hands, it might be limited, but in God's hands, there is an unlimited capacity. And what happens in this moment is that they come and they bring the five loaves, the two fish, and they're like, we don't know if we can solve every problem. But we know there's something that we can do. And I think in this moment, Jesus is trying to get to the core of what it means to be human. And, and the things that we do, the things that we sit on, the ways that we paralyze ourselves by inaction. 
And I wonder how many problems that God is trying to get at the core at it. And he's trying to get us to stop focusing on ourselves and, and deal with the problem of apathy. Or, or deal with the problem of pride. Deal with the problem of greed. And I wonder how many people had something to give in that moment. I don't think this little boy was the only one that brought the lunch. But he might have been the only one who was willing to trust God with what he had. And he said, it's not mine, it's yours. And they go and they place these five loaves, these two fish in the hands of God. And then God does what we can't do on our own. He multiplies. See, this is what happens when you entrust your life to Jesus. He multiplies. And, and we wonder, like, why do I feel like there's a void or there's a lack? It's because we're holding on to a life that's less than. And he's like, if you put it in my hands, watch what I can multiply. I can take that dream and I can multiply it. I can take that relationship and I can multiply it. I can take that hope and I can multiply it. I can take that peace and I can multiply it in my hands. I am an accelerant. I wonder what life we are squeezing to death. And we're not going to find the life that we hope for. We're not going to actually step into being full of life until we fully open ourselves and give God everything, even the little five loaves and two fish of our lives. And then verse 10, after Jesus takes what was made available to him, it says, Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place. And they sat down, about 5,000 men were there. And Jesus then took the loaves. And I love this moment so subtle and profound, gave thanks. If Jesus himself can give thanks, what in the world is stopping you? If Jesus himself could humble himself and posture in such a way where he's giving thanks to his father before the miracle, See, I think a lot of us want to thank God after he moves. What could happen in your life if you give him thanks beforehand? Yeah. Yeah. It says, Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. And when they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. Sounds like my mama growing up. <laughs> right? Even still to this day, I, I feel guilty if there's like a little kernel of corn on my plate. <laughs> like mama said, we don't waste food in this house. I said, okay. But let nothing be wasted. And so they gathered them. And they filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. I want to just thank God that they didn't try to bring the fish as well. That would have smelled. That would have been nasty. Jesus was very clear. Hey, make sure. Just gather the leftover breads. Twelve basketfuls. And after the people saw the sign that Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. And Jesus, knowing that they had intended to come and make him king by force, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Which that moment alone is just really powerful because if you've ever thought that God is power hungry, you have not truly met God. God does not position himself to overpower. God was not interested in elevating himself so that he can be made king and rule. He knew the way that he would rule humanity was by the way that he would serve, by the way that he would model what a true king looks like, what a true human being full of life looks like, where they're always living open-handed, always pouring life out for others. This is kept 
with the character and nature of God, that God is far less interested in being seen as a position of power as he is being seen as the person who will go to the lowliest places, who will humble himself and find things that the world needs to see that without him they will never see. And it's this beautiful moment where after Jesus does a miracle, he takes these limited resource, five loaves, two fish, and all of a sudden there's excess. All of a sudden there's more than they started with because that's what God's trying to help us tap into. It's the principle of generosity. That he is the ultimate generous being. And, and that God's saying, if you invite me into the process, if you invite me into the story, if you invite me into your life, I will always leave you with more than you came with. And it's this beautiful moment where Jesus is trying to change what we see and he's trying to change what we act. Because the last thing that's important that when we're talking about being full of life is that when we change how we act, we will increase our capacity. And that's about looking in. Everybody say look in. Look in. It's doing that inward assessment to, to go have I trusted God with all of my gifts and talents? Have I trusted God with all the resources of my of my heart? Have I trusted God with all the relationships that matter to me? It's the inward dialogue where we say, God, I believe that there's more that you want to expand in me. If you can change what I see, then it'll change how I act. And it will change my impact in the world around me. God is a God of abundance. Have you figured that out yet? He's a God of more. He's just waiting for us to trust him in the middle of the process. A few months ago, a year ago, a decade ago, I have no idea when this happened, but Beck and I had friends over for dinner and we love hosting people at our house. It's our favorite thing to do. And, and we had some dear friends come over and, and I was really excited to cook and and I wanted to make like this dish that I love to make. And I just spent all day just like prepping and, and not just prepping the food. Because when you're a chef, right, you know the first battle begins in your, in your mind. The presentation and what they feel, what they encounter, what they experience. And I just wanted everything to go perfectly because we loved our friends and just wanted it to be a great night. So we start cooking it. And I went to the store and, and I... If I can just shoot straight for a quick second, money was tight. You ever been there? And where money was tight, you know? Where you, you opened up your bank account and then you, you prayed <laughs> for God to do a miracle? You're like, God, I'm not asking for anything illegal, but can you just, can you, can you increase? And sometimes, yes. This was not one of them times. So uh, money was a little tight and so, what I wanted to do, we couldn't fully do. So we just had to do like a little lesser than experience a little bit, right? And there was four of us. And so trying to do the math of how much chicken sh should we buy and how much sauce and how much drink you know, and all this. And I'm, I'm just trying to like, also I got four kids. I'm trying to be responsible. If, if my friends Rachel and Alex eat, but my kids don't eat, am I being responsible? <laughs> and so I cooked this meal and it was like everything. I, I was like, I hit it. Today was a good day, and I'm serving the bowl, and I'm so excited, and I go, and, and I give them their bowls, and then I give my wife her bowl, and I'm just like, I don't want to eat, because I want to make sure, like, oh, do they like it? And I watch them just, like, start eating it, and bite after bite after bite. It's like, you could see, oh, oh, I think they like it. And I was like, oh, yes, we did it, babe. They're going to tell all their friends, like, Oh, we went and had the best meal of our lives. And he's a pastor, so Jesus must be real, right? And it's just everything was going great. And, and so then I sit down, and, and they're like, are you going to eat? I was like, oh, no, I've, I've just been smelling all day. I'll just wait. And 
I was like, well, do you want seconds? And my friend Alex was like, yes, please. I said, yes, I go over to the bowl and the pot and I scoop him seconds. And he's like, oh, thank you so much. And I give it to him. And, and this brother ate the seconds in like 12 seconds. <laughs> and you ever looked at somebody and you knew they wanted to ask the thing, but they felt guilty and they couldn't? I knew we wanted a third. <laughs> but he's like, I can't ask for a third. Like, you just saw me scarf this down. And, and then his wife, Rachel, also wanted second so I filled her bowl and then I, and I'm looking at this pot and I'm like oh no oh no there's not enough so I fill her bowl and I go and I I give it to her and, and she's eating her second I'm still looking at my friend Alex and he's waiting for me to ask and there's barely enough for a third bowl which was supposed to be my bowl and I said Alex would you like a third bowl yes please yeah <laughs> So I go over to the pot and I'm scraping <laughs> like the little bits, like trying, and, and I'm praying again, Jesus, can you multiply? You took five loaves and two fish. Can, can you, I, I literally, I put the lid on it. <laughs> I said, Jesus, can you multiply in your name? Amen. I took the lid off. No, he didn't. The same <laughs> little bits, and I just scraped as much as I could, and I gave him like a, a half bowl. And he goes and he eats it, and he enjoys it. And they're like, "You're not gonna eat?" And I'm like, "No." <laughs> just, I'm, I'm. The meal for me tonight is you. It's community. <laughs> and I, I remember that moment. It marked me because God is a God who can increase. God is a God who can multiply. But God is also the God that cannot multiply what we first do not give him. And, and I wonder how many times in our lives we're, we're, listen, we're living a life that's half full. Not because God didn't have a full life, but because we have been scraping the bottom of that pot saying, God, this is all that I have to give for you. And because we didn't see the abundance waiting for us, we only saw the scarcity. We only saw the five loaves and two fish. And we said, God, what in the world could you do with this? And then what he looks right back at us and says, do you know what in the world I can do with that? But it first has to be placed in my hands. You first have to act with what you got. And I wonder for you today, maybe you're here and you've been living a half-life. Maybe you're here and you feel like you don't have enough for God to truly not just change the world, but change you. And here's what I know about God. He already has in mind what he wants to do with you. He's already dreamed of all the good that he can do in you. He's been daydreaming your entire life, waiting for this moment. If she could just trust me, with it all, all the pain, all the brokenness, all the fear, all the despair, all the worry. If he could just trust me with all the past, the trauma, the anxiety, the desperation. If they could know who I truly am at my core and just place it in my hands there is no limit to all the good that I could do, but you first must act and you first must change what you see and you first must trust that God can do what only he can do. I want all of us to bow our heads and, and close our eyes. 
And the reason we do this is just to eliminate all the distractions. It's to silence all the voices. It's to create a sacred moment so that God can speak. If you're here and, and this has been your truth, that you know that there is just more in you waiting to be unleashed. You know that, that you've been holding on to existence, desperately trying to find life. That you know that God has been testing you time and time and time again, but he wasn't testing you to try to catch you. He wasn't testing you to try to show you how terrible you are and to condemn you, to judge you, but he was actually trying to test the core of your soul so that you could know that he's been waiting for this moment right now. That every moment of your life was leading to this moment when you could just hear God remind you that you are fully loved. That there is a full life waiting for you that that he knew this moment would matter. And so that's why 2,000 years ago, he had the moment that would matter above all. And he allowed himself to be crucified for this moment. He allowed himself to be killed and mocked and ridiculed for this moment. He allowed himself to be void of life on this side for this moment. And then he conquered the grave. He rose from the dead so that you could know that there's nothing that he cannot overcome. So that you could know that there is not choice that you could make that could keep you from his love. He conquered death so that you could know that life will always win. And that even when we have been the walking dead, he has come to bring us back to life. And maybe that's you right now. And it's finally time to let the love of Jesus consume you from the inside out. And if that's you, then right now, all you have to do is say this simple prayer. I want you to tell him right now, say, Jesus, I give you my life. Tell him right now, say, Jesus, I give you my life. And it's when you utter those words with the living God, your soul is brought back to life. Jesus, I give you my life. Okay, if you prayed that prayer right now, I want you to raise your hand as quick as you can so I can pray for you. Beautiful, I see you. Anyone else? Keep your hand up high. Beautiful. Jesus, I give you my life. I want you to hold it up high. Don't be ashamed. Don't be scared. This is you declaring I'm all in with Christ. No turning back. Anyone else? I see you because Jesus will all, anyone else? Come on, one more. He will always give us one moment, one more moment to choose life. Beautiful. Father, I pray for every hand held high in this room. I pray you would wrap them in your love, Jesus. I pray that you would remind them that grace is more powerful than shame. I pray that you would set them free today, that the voices of the past would die in the past and that they'll be resurrected to new life. They would choose hope, that they would know that they belong to you and that when we belong to you, we truly live the life that we are created to live. So we thank you, Jesus, that in you, you multiply all the good. We thank you, Jesus, that in you, you bring us back to full life. And today, Jesus, we ask that we would walk out of this place completely filled to the brim with hope, with peace, with joy, that all the things that we've been searching for without you would be deposited into our soul so that we could explode in the world around us. We thank you, Jesus that you are the source of life. We love you, and we ask all this in your name. Amen. That was beautiful. I love that so many hands were raised. Just if you could give me a moment, because this is important, that so many of you chose to give your life to Jesus. And I know he's been waiting for you for so long. And he wants to welcome you home. And we want to welcome you home because this place is filled with beautiful, kind, the most incredible people. And we want to make sure that you um, meet new friends and make this 
moment matter. And um, we're just so grateful that you gave your life to Jesus, that you're here. There are people in a team at the back patio that have this Bible to give you as a gift. And Adolfo is one of them that will be back there. And we want to meet you, know your name, know your story, and get you connected here at Mosaic. What I love about the scriptures is that it's stories of just people just like us trying to figure out life and getting it wrong and getting it wrong and then getting it right. So make sure you grab this and open it up to John, start reading, and just watch to see how God changes your life from the inside out. Um, And I'm going to ask the offering team to come down. I love that uh, Joe was saying about multiplying and that God can't do anything without you giving first. Then he multiplies. So let's make a choice today. Maybe it's that you've never given and you're like, I just don't know how. Like, I'm just holding on so tight. Then maybe that first choice is just to give. The small thing that you have, whatever's inside of you to give today. Or it is, I give, but I just don't give consistently. Or I don't give tithe, which is your 10%. And that is you consistently saying, okay, every month I'm going to give 10% to God. And watch how God multiplies that. Watch how God multiplies your life, your relationships, and everything about you. Um, So we're going to ask the offering team to pass the buckets. And just give yourself a moment. Maybe you just need to ask God, okay, what is it that I'm holding on to that I need to give to you? And know that you can multiply and do so much more with it.